joyful and thankful you've decided to worship with us today. I invite you as you're able to stand up and join us on these first two songs.
assembled body of Christ called Kingsway, you and confirmation, what we have been talking about uh, is when we talk about what is the church, we talk about the church as people, you, me, I, us, and it is so good to be in worship together, amen? Pat, my name is Pastor Scott Bonds, the associate pastor here, and just excited to be here despite all of the things that uh, could draw us away. We are here. We are here to worship. We are here to learn. We are here to serve. As we get started, just a couple of announcements. I always want to draw your attention to our Connect card that you will have received on your way in or will find a link in the email um, for those of you watching at home. And our Connect card is exactly that, just a way for us to connect. So if you haven't been here a while, this is your first time here or you're here every week, uh, please drop some information down. Let us know what service you're here. Uh, but if there's some way in which we can connect, whether you get our email or you don't get our email or you want to get plugged in to uh, youth ministry or children's ministry or college age ministry or a Sunday school class or a life group or you want to serve, your Connect card is a way to do that. And if uh, you fill it out here today, just drop that in the pen on the basket on your way out. By way of announcements, I uh, just want to draw your attention to uh, some high school senior events. Um, we have talked about this before, but it is our desire to, to connect and have conversations about life and faith and next steps and, and all of those kind of things with our high school seniors. Um, so our next event will be in April, April 8th, um, and it'll be a good time of, of connecting and having fun together as well as having those conversations. So if you are or have a high school senior, uh, you know a high school senior, uh, please have them reach out to me. You can do that via email or just uh, grab one of my business cards and it's got my cell phone number. They can call or text me and let me know and we'll be sending out more information about what those connections look like. Kingsway, over the last year or so, is we've talked a lot about our discipleship pathways. The thing, one of the things that makes us unique and that is how we're going to live out our call to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the tra transformation of the world. And so one of those pathways that we've talked a lot about is mentoring. And one of the ways in which we live that out is through summer internship opportunities uh, for college-age people. So we've done that the last few years. It is our plan to do that again for uh, up to two, high, uh, two 
college-age people. One will focus on the area of our family ministry, so students and children's ministries, and we'll be an active participant in mission trips and camp opportunities over the course of the summer. The second will be for those interested in uh, communication, so communication, reach out to me. I would love to buy them a cup of coffee and just to have a conversation about what that might mean. It's a 10-week internship, paid internship, uh, roughly running from the end of May until the end of July. We have a great and growing family ministries from children to youth, volunteers to make that happen. So just want to draw your attention to opportunities to serve in those areas. If you like kids, you like youth, and if you don't, you should. They are fun. It is a great time. It is a great opportunity to give and to serve. the corner it feels. Um, and so with that and Lent and all that, that means in life of the church, uh, but our children's ministry is looking for Easter candy or candy that can be done for our Easter egg hunt. Um, please, uh, we remain up free when it comes to that candy, uh, but if you can go and pick up some Valentine's candy on the cheap uh, or um, you want to order some from Amazon and have it drop shipped here, please uh, we'll be collecting those for quite a few weeks. Just drop them off in Lakin's office or see any staff member here at Kingsway, and we can make sure it gets to where it needs to go. As we think about all of these things, just to remind you that children are always welcome in worship, but we do have awesome opportunities at 915 and 1015 for our children. And if you ever have any questions about that, please reach out to Lakin until they are Generations Director. Whew, that was a lot, wasn't it? All right, so as we prepare to continue in worship, we move now to a time of prayer. All of us from different places across Springfield and the surrounding area with lots of things on our hearts and lots of things on our minds. We come uh, with grief and, and sadness oftentimes with the losses of loved ones. We think of the family of uh, Debbie Persing at her passing. But not just things that we can talk about, right? We often all have deep sorrow and, and struggles that we can't even begin to lift up, and we, we come here despite those. And oftentimes we come here okay, right? We come here with joys, and we come here with celebrations, and oftentimes we are hesitant to share those things because it feels like bragging. But it's okay to be okay. It's okay to be good. It's okay to have good things in our life. But we all come here with all of these different things to come and to be the people of God, to come and be the church. So take a look around and look at the people around you, behind you, Bill, in front of me, you. you. Uh, and we all come and look and, say, and look and see each other, and some of us may have concerns and grief. If you also look around, you may see a neighbor that has joys and things to celebrate. But one of the things scriptures talk about is we come to celebrate and grieve together. We come to worship together. So no matter where you find yourself today as we prepare to pray, we come together. Will you pray with me? God, no matter how we come, we come today. We come with burdens on our hearts, things that cause us deep sadness, God, sometimes we come angry, but sometimes we come filled with joy overflowing in our lives, and we just can't wait to share it with someone. But we come to worship you. We come, as your word says, to weep with those who weep and celebrate with those who celebrate. We come to worship together with one heart and one mind to lift your name high. And so, God, for those friends, for Debbie Persing's family, we pray for peace and comfort at her loss. God, for those just struggling and, and can't muster up the words to say to another human being about uh, what is going on in our lives, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would surround them and provide whatever it is that's needed. God, sometimes maybe it's through us, so God, use us 
to be healers. But God, we come celebrating and we come with good things and we rejoice. We celebrate together over those things. But God, we come to worship and to serve. We come to be transformed, to hear what our opportunities are to be your hands and your feet. So God, as we seek to to be transformed, as we seek to to align our hearts with your heart, as we seek to, to be your people and to be more like Jesus, help us. And God, we do that by praying the way that you taught your disciples to pray so long ago when you taught them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Yesterday, I was at a drive through and Chloe dropped her Mickey Mouse or something and was having a nervous breakdown. So I was leaning down 
trying to find it so that I could silence her. And apparently the person in front of me in the drive-thru had proceeded upward. Forward. Not upward. That'd be weird if he just like took off flying. Anyway, all of a sudden the lady behind me acts as if I have ruined her life completely. She started slamming on her horn and like throwing her hands up. And I was like looking and she is like mad, like foaming at the mouth. You know what I did? I got out of the car and I punched her in her throat. I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. I wanted to for a split second, but I didn't. I actually, uh, I pulled up and I proceeded to pay for that woman's coffee. Because here's my thought process, okay? She's going through something this morning. And if I would have tried to get out of the car and give her a hug, it would have been super awkward. So I just bought her a coffee and I left. Life <clears throat> is really short. I don't know if it's because I tried to end my own life at one point or because both my parents passed away or what, but I'm constantly, constantly thinking about how short life is. Here's the thing. We have no idea what other people are going through. Like when people, strangers I don't know are rude to me or cut me off or don't say thank you when I hold the door open, I don't take that personally. I just remind myself that they are going through something that I know nothing about. They could possibly be leaving a loved one's funeral on their way to visit the divorce attorney. They could be in the middle of a custody battle. They could have had the morning from H-E double hockey sticks. And so instead of retaliating in an attempt to get some kind of justice, I try to be as kind as I possibly can because it's those people, the people that are grumpy and harboring resentment and angry, those people need love the most. Those people who are often the hardest to love need love the most. So I encourage you today to not let other people get to you and just remind yourself that they are fighting an invisible battle that we know nothing about. So just be kind. Let's just let's just get some love going in the universe today. I feel like that's that's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling it right now. I feel like we all, you know, if we all do a little something kind for somebody else today, there could be a big shift in the energy level of the planet. And I think it'll be really cool. Anyway, I love you. Okay, bye. Hello, I am Pastor Karen, and I welcome all of you to worship and a part of our community today. Community is a big and important word when we are talking about church. As sung this morning, as said this morning, we are united in Christ. We're also people who come from the world to join together in fellowship and worship. Sometimes we find that like the world, in the church, there is also conflict. Last week we named our three-week series Confronting Conflict through the study of the anatomy of peace. This is a fictional story of two groups of people in conflict, teenagers and their parents. But the way to renewal is to have a heart of peace as opposed to the situation that was presented in this video of juggling the Jenkins where the driver behind her had a heart of war. I don't know if there's anything in that video that you identified with but the reaching down under the seat to find something to soothe somebody behind me in the van really resonates. So I'm in the middle of doing the best I can when I'm reaching under the van trying to pass something back and help somebody out. And somebody thinks I've ruined their world. The slamming on the horn, oh, I could just feel that as she talked about that. The idea that we're going along doing the best we can and, and somebody comes out of somewhere with their own stuff. Their own stuff might be the need to believe that they are better than someone else. Or the need to believe that they deserve more than others. To be well thought of by others or to reduce expectation because of some perceived lack in themselves. The anatomy of peace is not about just being nice to another person. When we're talking about peace, it is the refusal to exaggerate our differences. Because sometimes that's a lot easier <laughs> to find out all oh, the reasons we're so different 
than to find ways that we are similar. It is also a refusal to go to war with another person. Atticus Finch famously said in To Kill a Mockingbird, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. We're talking about confronting conflict. How do we deal with disagreement as Christians? My sermon today isn't about one issue, although I bet we could list, I don't know, 30 more minutes worth of issues that we have heard about hot topics in the world today or even in the church. But this series is more about how God calls us to be when we are in conflict. Over the years, I have been surprised in church debates how, <laughs> church debates, let's just, yeah, um, how little people have, have listened to one another, to have actual conversations as opposed to me throwing out my stance to you and saying this is a conversation and not listening, not having empathy, not being curious or asking questions. There is one who taught us skills about how to be in situations like that and have empathy and ask questions. How many times did Jesus not shout back at somebody but ask another question had empathy was curious about what was going on in the life of the person you may know that the united methodist church has a global gathering of united Methodists every four years asterisk when there's not a global pandemic every four years when there's not a global pandemic. So, the last general conference, now there's been a called session since then, a special called session, but the last general conference was in 2016. I was one of the delegates of uh, persons across the world that went to Portland um, for this event, and while I was there, I found um, myself in relationship with a person who was very different uh, than I am, especially in uh, one of the issues in the United Methodist Church, a struggle that we have today around issues of human sexuality. Over the course of the first week, because you're there two weeks as a delegate, a pastor from Zimbabwe and I found that we had a lot in common. Our passion for young people and their vocational exploration was central to both of our ministries. We found this out and had ways and fun times uh, of celebrating that. We even had one degree of separation um, from, from someone that obviously we both knew. Did I mention that we had to relate through interpreters and sign language? I will admit, um, after that first week of talking about young adults in ministry, when we moved to the legislative session and our differences were pronounced, I was shocked. This man thought differently than I did. I was dumbstruck for a day, and I think I, a whole day I pulled back um, from not even, you know, being in conversation with him. And then I realized I wanted to be in relationship with this child of God more than I wanted to tear him down. I, I drew something from being in his presence. So rather than trying to spend the rest of my week trying to sway to his issues, I thought, I need to learn French, because that was a relatable language between the two of us. Before or if I ever attend another general conference, then I thought about preparing a defense. I thought about how we might better relate. 
James Howell relates to this and what Francis Kisling said when he was interviewed by Krista Tippett. The pressure of coming to an agreement works against really understanding each other. Understanding one another only happens over time if we have curiosity, if we are hospitable, if we have genuine questions and empathetic listening with another. Steve Harper says, separatism is our greatest peril. The loss of the common good threatens life now and puts the future in jeopardy. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul offers pastoral instruction for one of the communities at odds. They're at disagreement. They're in conflict. There are issues of division stemming from several things, <clears throat> but the most pressing is their socioeconomic differences and how they put their practice of faith into practice. Paul sees them at a moment of crisis and testing. <clears throat> this is the early church, friends, so early that probably the Gospels haven't even been written at this point. This particular church, the one in Corinth, has been in existence for only about five years when Paul wrote them. He sees his role as a nurturer and a guide that the church might better understand what it means to be the church. He is calling them to unity in this text. One theologian writes that the whole letter of Corinthians should be read as an extended appeal for unity. So, we know that they're in conflict and he writes them from 1 Corinthians. You may find the scripture on the screen in your Bible or Bible app or in the Pew Bible in the New Testament. Just as a body, though, one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. For the gift of scripture, thanks be to God. Contemplate this. Oneness is the source and substance of life. Again, from Steve Harper, if he were pressed to name only one thing today that threatens the spiritual life more than any other, he would choose the absence of oneness in the world. He says separatism is our greatest peril. Too often we find ourselves a divided people, separated from others, the creation or our own selves. We're splintered into dualities and factions, rooted in fear, expressed in self-preservation. The loss of the common good threatens life now and puts the future in jeopardy. Because when we serve the causes of separatism, we live in the reverse of what God intends and what Jesus prayed when Jesus said that they will be one father just as you are in me and I am in you. That's from John 17. In our scripture in the Corinthians today, Paul, the Apostle Paul, remember, not too long ago, had been a persecutor of those who followed the way, but having 
come to know Jesus simply wanted to be sure that the believers in Corinth approached differences from the perspective of the cross, a sense of sacrifice. He told us that we're called to do the same with an attitude of humility and grace. Our first song today, a little bit more like Jesus, a little bit less like me. With grace, we can discuss our varied viewpoints without creating factions and divisions within the body of Christ. The cross, the example of Jesus, of humility and empathy, helps us reimagine who we really are and then align in unity. Biblical scholar Dominic Crossan talks about the story in which Jesus tells his followers, you, might, you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn your left cheek to them as well. Crossan explained that this offering of, of giving your left cheek isn't simply to be a doormat, allow others to practice whatever harmful behavior they like. Instead, turning the other cheek is a non-violent confrontational statement. Because just as Jesus was empathetic, Jesus could also be confrontational. He says this idea of turning the other cheek is a way to say, I will not run away, I will not hide, I will not ignore your behavior, nor will I cower before you. I will not let fear or anger overtake my soul. I will not perpetuate this cycle of violence. I will stand firm with dignity and exercise my right to exist on my own terms. Courtney Ball reminds us in a story he tells, this is not natural for most human beings. And, and I will say, this certainly does not come naturally to me. Ball says, I can't imagine what it must be like for Jesus or others who practice nonviolence as leaders to be faced with so much injustice, oppression, and br brutality and still respond with nonviolent confrontation. To be able to recognize the people who are causing you harm as a child of God, as broken people, and respond with truth-telling love even to the point of offering one's own life? No wonder people believed that Jesus was divine. This is not something most humans would do. It's too hard. But there's good news today. Today, Paul is reminding us the church gives us support. In the church, we are given our energy, our life source through the Holy Spirit, God alive and present among us. We're also not alone because as we supposedly turned and looked at one another today, we are reminded that we come together as broken and frail people, but we come together with hope and expectation that we are not alone and that we are joined together in Jesus. If we were able to see what we have in common with one another, we will realize what we can be and what we have with one another. One of my favorite folk artists, David Wilcox, puts it another way when he offers this funny and maybe hopeful piece about a couple <coughs> who's about to split up, maybe on their own thinking about the divorce attorney that they will look for. <clears throat> David Wilcox says, the man says, sometimes we're arguing and it takes her forever to see what's wrong. But then an alternative approach presents itself. Instead of him making his own case and dismantling hers, he, for the sake of love, makes a case for her as best as he is able. 
and she makes a case for him as best as she is able. And instead of getting attorney, they become each other's attorney. That's when understanding and peace happen. First Corinthians reminds us of our connection and our need for grace. The anatomy of peace reminds us that when in conflict, moving from a heart of war to a heart of peace requires very first humility. We have to admit that we are broken. We have wounds. We have shards of sin in our own hearts. So in humility, we admit our need for God's help. When we're able to say we need healing, we need forgiveness, we can open ourselves to the transforming power of God. And then we realize in our brokenness and failure what can be. Like myself and the pastor from Zimbabwe, oneness of mind was found in our relationship with Jesus. First, we were brothers and sisters serving a God of love and grace. And so like Paul, I remain committed and encouraged to more clearly name our shared body and what it is that we have in common. It doesn't mean that there isn't conflict, but to be able to say that we share the essentials of faith, the goodness of God in creation and in Jesus Christ, salvation, redemption, The way to unity is what God requires of us, even if we're not on our own bound and determined to have unity. Ephraim Radner puts it so wisely, to live is to give up and give away parts of ourselves. And to live fully is to give ourselves away fully. To be one church, to be united, is to be joined in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who gives us what we need. Not unlike the ancient city of Corinth, the potential to see divisions is all around us. Discord seems a lot easier than finding, finding discord is a lot easier than finding unity these days. So, we can stay where we are in a heart of war or begin again with a heart of peace, with a sense of curiosity about our neighbor, the child of God. Our challenge in a a season of confrontation is to widen our vision to not what's going wrong, but where God might be doing something in the church today. We have, we have said it, sung it, prayed it again today that God is alive. God has hope for all of us. So let's look for signs of the Holy Spirit for each and every individual that comes into the church. For those who might be coming to the church Might we begin to see in a new way, not as transmitters of hostility, but vessels of holiness? God, as you have given us so many gifts, gifts that complement one another, might we pause to give thanks, to remember that you have given us these gifts for a purpose and that as we see with hope and reconciliation and peace the world around us we might cast a little more hope a little more joy in Jesus name we pray amen
want to invite you to stand as you're able and sing this last song with us. It's a song called How Great Is Our God. Can't think of a better way to end today's service. justice that we might know the truth of your ways send us as artists who bear the joyful burden of your creativity that we might bring light into the darkness and hope to the despairing and grant us the joy of fellowship with your spirit and one with one another this day and forever amen